Um, so I'm Lynn White. I'm the Education and Volunteer Specialist for Butler Soil and Water Conservation District. I'm going to talk about pollinator pests and then we talk about a few gardening um, volunteer events that are coming up um, if anyone is interested at the end. But if you've got a pollinator garden, we all love to see like the butterflies and the bees and all these awesome animals that we're planting these gardens for. But we don't always get the bugs that we want. We also get a lot of pollinator pests. And so I'm going to highlight a few of them here. All right. So um, the first one is our milkweed bugs. And you usually find them in small groups clinging on the underside of the leaves and on the stems. Um, you can find them in all stages of growth on the plants from midsummer to late summer. They will mainly eat the milkweed, but they're omnivorous, which means they're also going to eat eggs and small caterpillars. Um, you can recognize the adults by kind of the, the two diamonds that they have on their back, um, which are kind of the wing, the wing pads there on their back. Um, the best way to protect your seeds from them so they're not sucking the life out of the seeds is to put a rubber band around this, the seed or some people use the little footsie stockings that you can get and put those over the, the pod as well. So if you want to protect the seeds from getting munched on by the milkweed bugs, then um, yeah, I usually rubber band the ones in my yard. Another one you get that's actually really pretty is the milkweed beetle. And these little guys are, herb I can't speak, sorry, they're herbivores. And so you're not going to have to worry about the eggs or worry about them um, attacking the caterpillars or anything else, but they will eat the milkweed roots. And apparently they get really excited when they're eating um, the roots of the common milkweed and they start to squeak. Now, I've never heard it, but I'll take the word from the experts out there. But yeah, just like we start to make munching noises and num 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 noises, I guess, when we get excited about food, they get excited on the milkweed roots. If you have a bunch of the plants, they're not that big a problem. You can leave them if, if there's enough milkweed to sustain them. But if you've only got a few plants and it's going to cause problems for your monarchs and stuff, um, then pull them off and drop them into soapy water. It's usually the easiest way um, to dispose of those guys. Now, Japanese beetles, we're all familiar with those guys. Um, they're going to drink the nectar and eat the pollen on your, your milkweed. You can pull them off by hand and drop them into soapy water, or you can use pheromone traps. Now, the big thing about using the pheromone traps is that if you're um, hanging them in your garden where these plants are, you're actually going to attract more Japanese beetles to your garden. So put the pheromone trap well away from the plants that you're trying to protect. Um, you can also treat the, the grubs um, late summer, early fall by um, spreading the bacterial milky spore. But the Japanese beetles, I mean, they're, they get on a lot of different plants. Um, in butterfly gardens, you find them on many different kinds of milkweed and also on zinnias. So yeah, very common to find them. The leaf miner flies, they feed on several different species of milkweed. Um, don't get the fly confused with the leaf miner beetle that you can also find. But these guys are really small and the best way to get rid of them is to cut off the leaves. Don't put the leaves in your compost bin. Discard them in the trash um, so that you're not spreading this into the, the compost that you're going to use in other areas of your yard. Um, but yeah, so they, they will actually get into the leaf and suck the goodness out of the leaf, making it um, unsuitable for the caterpillars. So yeah, cut the leaves off, trash the leaves, best way to get rid of them. The weevils, I always love the name weevil, but they're not that attractive to look at. There's two different kinds. You get one variety that you find on common milkweed and they eat the young leaves and then they move into the stems. Another species will live on the swamp milkweed and they focus more on eating the stem and also laying their eggs in the stem. And if you get the weevils in your swamp milkweed, then you'll see the, um, the stems are beginning to droop. 
and you're, you're never going to get, going to get um, buds growing. The best way to get um, rid of them is to dump them into soapy water. So soapy water is a great friend to get rid of a lot of these different um, pests that you can get in your pollinator garden. Um, the oleander aphids, um, milkweed is in the same family as oleanders. So of course we're going to get these guys. You see them in a lot of different colors. Like you can see on the image there, there's some that are copper or black. And those are ones that have been um, attacked by a wasp larvae that, um, that is a parasitic. And so the orange ones there are healthy and the black and the brown ones are the ones that have been impacted by the wasps. But no matter what, you want to prune the plant to remove them. Um, and you can also spray with soap or with isopropyl alcohol. You could use a strong blast of um, water to blast them off as well, but you've got to be aware of where you're blasting these little tiny critters onto. And so I prefer just to prune them or to spray with, with soap. Rips, um, the little tiny freckle bugs, they can cause quite a bit of damage as well. They're really teeny tiny little things. Um, again, they're not that cute looking in the picture there, but they will ruin the leaves, they'll ruin the flowers, they'll ruin the seeds. So yeah, you want to get rid of them. And luckily, ladybugs and lace wings are natural predators of these guys. So you want to keep those good critters there. You want to keep the ladybugs and the, the lace wings around. Um, if you do get them, you can spray the infected areas of the plant with water. And again, your best bet is to cut off the affected area of the plant and discard it in the trash, not in your compost pile. Here's the swamp milkweed leaf beetle. Again, very attractive little thing. Don't get it confused with ladybugs. A lot of people see the coloring there and go, oh yeah, it's a ladybug. No, these guys are gonna come in and they're gonna eat many different types of your milkweed and they're gonna stop it from flowering and from seeding. So you want to use natural predators for these as well. And this is where stink bugs are actually your friend. Stink bugs will um, help to eat these guys. Um, so if you're not gonna, if you don't have very many stink bugs around or you're like anti-stink bug, then it's another creature that you can flick into soapy water. If you see them laying eggs, remove the eggs. But be aware that their eggs do get mistaken. Um, like the ladybug eggs can get mistaken as um, swamp milkweed leaf beetle eggs. So whenever I try and remove eggs, I like to see the creature that's been laying them to make sure I'm not um, removing a beneficial animal. Spider mites, hate these little guys. Um, so they're little predators and your best way of getting rid of them uh, because they're going to eat the eggs of your caterpillars is to use the their natural predators like the lacewing larva and then again cutting off the affected areas and throwing it in the trash and this one i wasn't finding much about using soap for these but isopropyl alcohol you can spray that on and that will shrivel and kill them Good luck finding them because they are absolutely tiny. It's usually easier to find the damage that they're doing than it is to actually see the, the spider mites themselves unless you've got them in mass. So when you're looking at pest control, um, pesticides shouldn't be used unless it's really necessary for plant health. A lot of people will go in and they'll do a preventative spray like several times a year, kind of like, oh, now is the date on my calendar. I'm going to go in and do this. Uh, but that's been shown to create more pest problems than it solves. Um, and you can end up seeing outbreaks of spider mites and aphids and scale insects where pesticides have been used like that. Not only can you kind of end up with more of those pests, but you can also have issues with the pesticide runoff um, impacting plants that you didn't want to get it on. And it'll also increase human and pet exposure. So don't go, hey, it's the second um, Saturday of the month. I have to go out and spray stuff. Only spray if you think you need it. And even then be very um, wary. Uh, but yeah, so these are the, the guys that you can end up getting more of if you do spray consistently that. More aphids, more spider mites, and more scale, which we don't want. 
I'm hoping the integrated pest management is something that JT is up on. I forgot to ask him. I've spoken to JT a lot this week, and that was one of my questions that I just totally forgot to ask about. But I'm hoping that he knows a lot more about this um, for any future questions that might come in the, the box. Uh, but your best bet is just avoiding the pest problems in the first place by um, monitoring and controlling when the numbers are low. Um, either bury the infested plant residues or put them in the trash, um, remove the, the pest habitat, the stuff that they've, um, and any stuff that they've invaded so far. Um, learn what you're looking at. You might think something's really gross looking, but it might be beneficial. I mean, some people get freaked out by seeing monarch caterpillars, and I think they're awesome. And then you've got that ugly little face in your swallowtail caterpillar. Usually it's the caterpillars we can tell they're, they're good, but with the bugs, it's a bit harder to tell. Um, and there's some really good books out there, and I'll, I'll post a few links to them on the, the website that I put on the chat box earlier. Um, so have a look at your plant to see if you actually do need any control because it's not always necessarily, other than you going in with gloves and peeling a few things off and tossing them into, um, into soapy water. So make sure that the problem has actually reached a level where control is necessary because if you've got some of those pest bugs on there, they are actually going to be food for birds and some other animals that are coming around and maybe they'll eat the pest and they'll not eat your, your monarch caterpillar. So there is pluses to having the pests on there. Um, look at your options. Is there ways that you can use the beneficial insects like the lace wings and the, um, the ladybugs? Is it better for you to do the manual removal or to do the trap, like I mentioned earlier with the um, Japanese beetles, but to do the trap further away or your last resort um, using the pesticides? But if you're going to be using pesticides, you have to think about when a lot of these animals are active. Most bees and other pollinators, ignoring the moths here, most of them are active during the day, except for your moths, they're gonna be out there at night and a few of the beetles will be out at night. So if you are going to go in with chemicals, you're better to do it when our pollinators are not um, jumping around from flower to flower. If anything that's got, has got flowers on it, it is actually a good idea to spray the chemicals after the past bloom or even remove the bloom so that you're not attracting the pollinator to something that you've just went and put a bunch of chemicals on. Uh, but be aware of timing for it. Your pollinators are going to be most active during the day. You do not want to spray anything at that point. Um, if you're going to be spraying stuff on the leaves, this is most effective on your soft body critters like your aphids and your leaf hoppers and the thrips and so on. Uh, most of the like insecticidal soaps are not toxic to pollinators after the spray dies. So again, if you spray in the evening, you're not going to be hitting those, um, those pollinators except for the moths which we don't want to kill off the moths, but um, it's moths or a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, so yeah, spray with, um, at dawn or dusk. Um, if you're gonna use horticultural oils, they work best when the spray comes in contact with the critter. So don't just stand there and spray the world around you. Um, make sure you're actually spraying it on the stuff that is a problem. Um, and once the oil dries, it doesn't have much of an effect um, for most pollinators and beneficial insects. Um, just make sure you're not spraying those beneficials. And again, spray at dawn and dusk when the, the, most of your pollinators are not active. There's a whole bunch of biopesticides that are advertised out there and they vary in their toxici toxicity to the different pollinators. Um, be very wary of the, the third bullet point there. Um, Bavaria bassanaya is toxic to bees. So look at the ingredients, and if possible, um, just skip the biopesticides. Uh, most of them are thought to have a low impact, but low impact, no impact. I'd rather go with the no impact um, and use um, the soaps and pull them off by hand. Also beware of stuff that is labeled as being EPA, reduced risk because most of those studies are only looking at the honeybee. They're not looking at all of our other pollinators out there. 
And a lot of recent studies have shown that native bees and wild bees are much more susceptible to insects, insecticides than honeybees. So the list is majorly limited. And much of the data isn't actually double checked. Um, so be very aware about the, anything that's listed on that EPA reduced risk product list. Uh, a great resource for looking at minimizing risk to pollinators and beneficial insects is um, the Xerxes Society. And I remember last month when we were online doing the class that um, Kathy had mentioned the Xerxes Society. I think it was for trees. So I know that so they're already listed on the website, but I'll make sure this publication is linked on the website as well. Um, but remember, not all ugly bugs are a problem. Check to see if what you're looking at is actually a pest or not. Manual removal is best and be really careful when you're disposing of those leaves so that you're not, um, you're not going to impact the rest of your garden by spreading those critters. That's my contact information. Um, as I mentioned, I'll put stuff on our website. Our website is second from the bottom there and it'll be under our pollinators page. So it'll be backslash pollinators. There's also information on that pollinators page about planting milkweed. If you are planning to plant milkweed, fall is the perfect time to do it because then um, you can plant the seeds straight in the ground and you don't have to um, put it in moist paper in the fridge for like several weeks in the spring. And so there's information on that website um, about how to plant uh, milkweed. And talking about milkweed, I'm going to share a separate screen with you um, because I have information about collecting pollinator or collecting milkweed seeds. And now is kind of the time for collecting milkweed seeds. Uh, our office has been the county drop-off spot for the last four or five years. And it's for common milkweed. We do accept other varieties of milkweed seed. You just have to mark it really carefully on the bag so that we know it's not common. Um, you can generally tell by looking at the seed pods. Um, the dates are from September 1st through October 30th. The thing is, you don't go out now and go, oh, there's a whole bunch of milkweed seed pods, I'm gonna collect them. Because if they're not ripe, then the seeds are not gonna be viable. Um, but I did mention that there's a couple of, there's like the different kinds out there. Um, if you look at the top set of pictures, we've got common milkweed, we've got those rounded leaves and Dogbane has got the pointy leaves. A lot of people get dogbane confused with common milkweed. And then the bottom two sets of pictures are showing the seed pod difference. Common milkweed have got those spikes running along them. Swamp milkweed is smooth. So you can still drop off um, swamp milkweed pods, but just mark really carefully on it, big letters, so it's easy for us to see that you are dropping off um, swamp milkweed and not common because we'll use the swamp milkweed for projects here in Butler County and we'll separate the seed. Um, the common milkweed seed that we collect is sent to a prison and the prisoners separate all the seed from all over the state. And then we receive seeds back here in Butler County for doing projects. And that's the seed that I've given out in packets at the first couple of um, pollinator workshops that we did in the series. So if you help collect seeds, then um, we give them out to free to the public for them to try and plant more milkweed. So we can basically cover the county in milkweed. Um, yep, so here's dogbane. A lot of people confuse it and you can see the picture on the right there. The, they have um, seed pods that are much skinnier. They're, they're kind of like witch's fingers um, or very long skinny cigar um, cigars. Um, if you want to drop off some dog bane, I have places where we can use it. But again, mark the bag very, very carefully. But the state is looking for common milkweed. So that's the stuff that we will be sending off to the state. Um, don't pick the pods like they are in the picture on the left there. Um, you've got the green pod in the, the very creamy colored seeds. Wait until the seed pod itself is brown, like a golden brown um, color. And when you crack it, you see they've got the dark brown seeds there. 
if the seed pods have already cracked open and it's crawling in milkweed bugs, then don't collect it. Um, because then those milkweed bugs will transfer to all of the other milkweed seed pods that people have dropped off in our container. Um, and they'll, they'll basically suck the juices, they'll suck the life out of the seeds. So if there's just a few on there and you can flick them off, great. But if it's crawling in them, don't, don't give them to us um, because they'll suck the, the life out of most of the seeds. And we had a big problem two years ago with that. In fact, our entire office was crawling in bugs um, and the other staff were not that fond of me after that, but they're still up with this collecting. Now, our office is um, closed to the public just now, but the container is out in the hallway so you can get to it. The building itself is open and so you can get to the container. Um, but a few tips for collecting. Um, squeeze the pod. If the center seam pops open, then they're ready to be harvested. Don't, as I mentioned, don't take the ones that have already opened that are infested with bugs. Use paper bags to collect them in. If you put them in plastic bags, they sweat and then they begin to rot. So use paper bags. If you don't have paper bags, then a box works. Or we have a stack of paper bags next to the collection container in our building. Make sure that you have permission to collect from the property that you're on. So if you are not collecting from your yard, make sure you have permission. You don't want to get caught trespassing. Um, and I know that Metro Parks of Butler County um, don't allow us to collect on their property. We have to fill out permits. So you'd have to fill out a permit to be able to collect on Metro Parks property. Um, so we don't want to upset them. Uh, but there's many other sites around the county. There is a picture of the container that is out in the hallway. And yes, we had to cover it in not for trash signs because people were putting trash in it. Um, but it's the same building that JT is based in. So it's a Butler Soil and Water Ohio State Extension building at 1802 Princeton Road. And anytime your seed pods are green, um, you can come drop them off. The building is open Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. until 4.30 p.m. Um, if you have some outside of those hours and you'd like to drop them off, email me um, and we'll figure out a spot for you to put them in, like outside the building, so I can get them in the morning. Um, Kathy also said that you can drop them off at um, her building um, at the Nature Center and the address is 101 Joe Nutsall Way, Hamilton. It's, in, it's on the road that's going down to Joyce Park on the left-hand side, and we are the only building that has a great big pollinator mural on the front of it. So, yeah, so it's a, another place, because if you drop them off here, if you're closer to here and you drop them off here, then we'll figure a way of getting them up to um, the container in the office, or we might use them for projects down here at the Nature Center, who knows? Um, but we did collect the big garbage can. We filled that two or three times we filled it three times two years ago. We only had one and a half containers last year. I've seen a lot of pods out there this year, so hopefully we'll have a lot. Um, we'll have a lot more this year. So that was the milkweed seeds. We're also going to be harvesting sunflower seeds, and this is to give seeds out to the public as well. We have a large demonstration area right next to our office on Princeton Road, and there was a pollinator buffer planted around the edges and there were like thousands of sunflower seeds. So we're gonna cut the heads and dry the heads and have a, a sorting day or a sorting evening in our office. But this is just a map showing um, where the little yellow thing is saying 1802 Princeton Road. That is the building that myself and JT are, are in. And the huge yellow flower there is the field. So most of the, the sunflowers are past, um, past their prime at this point, but there's still a lot of stuff in bloom out there. So if you're out near our office, have a look-see. Um, but the main reason for that is to showcase um, different practices, practices to farmers, to show buffers for pollinators, and to show different um, cover crops that can be used on farms to help keep the soil in place and improve the soil. Um, so that's right outside of the office. Um, but we'll be meeting on Thursday, October 1st at 5 p.m. till about 7 p.m. So if anyone is free and wants to take their frustration out on sunflowers, we'll basically be beating them up to get the seeds free. 
Um, it's kind of a lot of fun. I've, I've done it a few times in the past. So hopefully some people can join us. So that is the last of the screen sharing. Um, Got some questions. Yeah. Um, this one's for uh, Alfred. I get white fuzz when using um, dome trays. I think I'm saying that right. Is Alfred, are you still there? I'm here. Say the question again, you get white bugs when? White fuzz when using dome, D-O-M-E-D, -E trays. Um, I've never had that problem right off the top of my bat. I would say it's probably sounds like either the tray and dome itself needs a good cleaning or two, it sort of sounds like you might have some kind of fungus growing in there, which would probably tell me the temperature, the humidity, and the, and the moisture inside. I don't know if your dome is really wet on the inside, uh, but you can, you can create an environment that's going to let fungus grow if it's too moist and warm in there. But um, I've never had that issue, but... If you don't clean your domes and trays, I highly suggest you do. I also don't leave my dome on all the time. I basically um, put my dome on uh, late afternoon to capture some of the heat for the night and leave it on for the night. But I usually don't leave my dome on all the time. I take it off. I even blow air across my tables for um, a movement of, uh, movement of air in the, in the uh, greenhouse, because even though I have exhaust fans, they're not over the table. So uh, those, I've never had that problem, but that's what I would recommend. Thanks, Alfred. Uh, next question here. Um, putting rubber bands on the seeds at the base for, I believe that has to do with the pollinator, uh, with the uh, milkweed, I believe. Unmute yourself. I thought I had. All right. So I'm pretending that this is the seed pod. I actually put the rubber band halfway up along the seed pod. Sorry, I don't have a seed pod handy. They're all up at my office. Um, but yeah, so not at the base of it. You actually want that rubber band to hold the seed pod closed. So you do it halfway along the seed pod. So it's just so they can't. Oh, yeah, it's to try and stop the creatures from crawling in and stop the seed pod from opening too far. So it's actually really easy to go out and put rubber bands on now when the seed pods are green um, before they get too dry. And so that will stop them from popping open and letting the little creatures in. Sorry for the impromptu demo, but hey, it's the best I could do. Okay, uh, I believe everyone should be able to unmute themselves if you wanted to ask a question and not have to type it in the chat. I've got it set up to where you should be able to do that now. So if anyone wants to ask a question without typing in the chat, feel free. Okay, uh, this is Debbie. Um, since the milkweeds that I have are about six foot tall, um, as the season goes on, will they just die down by themselves? They they will they will oops hang on they will lose their leaves just like any other perennial. Um, but you will need to go ahead and cut those down. I usually cut them down maybe six or eight inches from the top from from the ground. Okay. Okay, I, I'm, yeah. I may have so to pay 14 inches. Um, really, they don't have to be cut down. Like I said before, we try to leave as, as many of our plants alone until spring. If you can wait until spring to cut them back, that's the best thing to do. Okay, because I had to stake them up because they got they were falling over. And I'm sorry, laid. Debbie, you were muted. Say that again. I had to stake them up because they were um, falling over and getting in the yard where the ga grass cutter was trying to run over them so <laughs> yeah they they can get really tall sometimes 
Yeah, they were pretty tall this year. So when you were asking the question earlier about the cats, right. do you have like a big clump of um, no, just a few? Yeah, last year was the first year I ever had them. Um, so they were only about maybe three or four foot tall and only had maybe four stalks. Um, this year they went a little crazy and um, so they're about six foot tall, but I probably have maybe six, I'm trying to find a picture of them, uh, maybe six or eight. Um, I don't know if you can, I probably can't see that. Oh yeah. Oh wow. I've got this and this is what came up this year and I'm in a small space and I'm hoping to move them to another space that they can, you know, get bigger and spread out a little bit more. Yeah, because I was wondering if there was only a few plants, if the, the caterpillars were getting picked off by birds and that's why you were only seeing one or two. Well, that's um, why I want a bigger clump, then it's easier for them to hide and it's less noticeable when they're eating the leaves. Right. Um, so the predators don't see them. Right. And I I'm just thought- I'm doing the same as you though. I'm moving mine to a larger area that my husband doesn't know about yet that he's going to complain about. <laughs> And I just bought a small plant, um, um, a purple monarch or purple milkweed. So I just bought that at the, I think the Bauer, Bauer Farms where they- Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, it's a purple, it says purple milkweed. Okay, so, so just know that there is some tropical milkweed that is sold frequently and um, it's great for the nectar, but they okay. will not lay their eggs on it, and the caterpillars will not use it as a food source. Um, oh, I got okay. that. I personally got some at um, at Burns, and I've also gotten some that were was from the Cincinnati Pollinator Pollination, mm -hmm. and it simply is just for nectaring. They will not lay their eggs on the tropical milkweed. So in this area, the best thing to, to have your caterpillars on is common or swamp. And there's actually a vine that's called heart vine milkweed that we grew up as kids all over fences and we would, I would, we would pull off the milkweed pods and we would throw them at each other like grenades. Um, I never saw a caterpillar actually eat on that heart vine milkweed until last week and at my own house, they devoured an entire fence full of that milkweed um, vine. So, uh, so, so keep an eye out for, for caterpillars on that. Um, but there is that there is that tropical milkweed that is sold around here. It's considered a pollinator uh, plant, but they only use it for nectar. They do not use it to lay their eggs. Hey, Kathy. Yes. Hey, Kathy. Uh, hey, it's Chelsea. So actually, I, I have had um, caterpillars on my tropical milkweed. I, I've planted them out like two or three times uh, before, and uh -huh. um, I get the the adults to pol you know the pollinate, and then I have seen adults and they completely strip them down to the stems. I find that they act, that the caterpillars actually love them way more than any of the like native common milkweeds. I've seen them do that to the swamp milkweed before, yeah. but I've never seen them do it to the to the top. Yeah, these this, this is like blood something, blood something. Um, it's got these really beautiful flowers, but yeah, I, um, okay. I, I planted them at the conservatory, and both years they just completely stripped them. Yeah, that's that's yeah. why people say always and never. Yeah, the only thing with those though, with the that you probably know is that you got to come down once uh, fall comes because otherwise the adults and just won't move on to their um, winter grounds. That's the that's a caveat with those guys, yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, I got your email so I can send off questions if I think of them. <laughs> <laughs> and besides that, I work down the hall, but you're not open all the time. <laughs> yeah, I'm usually hiding. <laughs>
Well, if there's no more questions, thank you so much, everyone, for getting on. And some of you have seen for four sessions, some have only seen for one or two, but we're really glad you're able to join us. Um, and hey, we're finishing on time, even though we started late. Yeah. Hopefully next year we'll be able to do them in person again. That would be good. But yeah, if you have any ideas for any classes that you would like, any of us, whether it's um, Troy and Kathy, myself, or JT, um, give us a heads up because we, we usually know someone. If it's not us, we usually know someone else that we can ask to come in and do talks. So um, yeah, get in touch. We're all lonely just now, so. <laughs> <laughs> We've all been cooped up. But JT, do you have anything to add? No, thanks uh, for all the participants today. And this is a great four part series. We started, uh, what is it, a year, almost a, yeah, eight months ago or something like that, a year ago. Um, I think it's something we could look into in the future again. Yeah. Oh, and I'll make Maybe sure that I share thing. Alfred's, I'll remember to share Alfred's web address. So Alfred, if you're still on here, we really appreciate you having me on as well. Um, it's nice to have a, somebody other than like the four of us talking. So that was awesome for you to share your information. No problem. I'm, I'm getting ready to put a, uh, well, I'm designing and putting a proposal together, put a, uh, I call it an insectary because I want to attract more than um, pollinators mm -hmm. on a 9,100 square, 9,100 square foot empty lot in Hamilton. So I'm going to chronicle that as I.